welcome back to the club. We are your hosts. I'm Ebony Chapman. And I'm Akila Friends. And of course, today we are joined by activist, actress, and documentary filmmaker, Jasmine Leva. So hello, welcome, welcome. Hey ladies. <laughs> How are you guys? Good. good. <laughs> Tired. I know that good was with such a sign. Are we good, sis? I, I don't know. Idea. I don't think we're good. <laughs> we're tired, but we are trucking along. So that's all that matters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How are you? What's up? I'm doing good. It's good. It's good. Honestly, I am so excited to have you here with us, Jasmine. I feel like, first of all, if you guys for the listeners, for the watchers, like this has been such a labor intensive, like communication, but trying to get Jasmine on the show. So we are so excited to have her here but today. You know, persistence is key. Communication is key. And I'm so glad. I know this discussion is going to be well worth the wait. So I yes, think, you know, shout out to your manager, Steven. I just wanted to tell, <laughs> I just wanted to give him a little kudos because yes. he is really on his ish. Okay. He's really on it. <laughs> Um, but let's start from the beginning, Jasmine, for people who don't know um, your works. And so I really want to give them a little bit of background before we like get deep into it because there's so much here. Um, so tell us how you became multi-talented, multi-hyphenated. Like where did, where was your start? What was, what inspired I love it. This is my hype woman right here. Okay. So <laughs> I just, when I was young, I always wanted to be in front of the camera, behind the camera. Like I've always loved this stuff. I was writing plays since fourth grade. I was acting in plays since I was about seven years old. So that just came naturally. And then when it was time to go to college, originally I was gonna go to school for marketing, but then I was just like, hey, this isn't really what I wanna do with my life. Forget it, let me go to LA and study film and TV. So I did that, got a job in film and TV, started working on documentary series. And then I would do, I would act in national commercials, Um, At the same time, you know, brands like Nissan, Apple, Uber, just a bunch of brands. And then I finally decided, hey, you know, it's time for me to create something with my name on it. So that's when I left the company that I was at to create The Invisible Vegan, which is a social justice kind of documentary about Black food ways and just how we're left out of mainstream kind of health narratives, were you always a vegan or, you know, throughout that journey, as you mentioned, going from marketing to deciding to go back to your roots within film and just media, did you also decide to take a health check and say, you know, veganism is for me? Oh, no, I did not. Uh, I was not vegan growing up. I was cleaning buckets of chitlins growing up. So that's where I was. I was very far, very, very far from vegan. Like, hey, I'm going to Chipotle. I need all four meats on my burrito, not vegan, just so we're clear. But um, when I came out to LA, you know, I became exposed to different lifestyles and I met a vegan. I was like, wow, that's awesome. Tried it. And it kind of just stuck. I I love that. I mean, I honestly know a few vegans and I definitely want to talk about that. But before we jump into your documentary and everything that is vegan, people always talk about, like, I swear, every time we do an interview, people are always like, I left my nine to five and then I went and I pursued my dream. So like, tell me what, which is amazing because yes. we're at that stage yes. where we're like, we, when can we leave the nine <laughs> and the five? Oh wait, bye. Like, when can we leave it? Because we are so over it. But, um, but I want to know like, what, what space did you feel like you needed to fill when you decided, you know what, nine, my nine to five, A, was never doing it for me or it was, it served a purpose, but now I'm ready to move on. A little bit of both. Like in the beginning, I, lo- I did, I loved it um, with a passion. But then, you know, TV, the TV industry has this habit of kind of um, exploiting your workers. So when they have a good worker, it's just like, oh, let me have them do 50 million things instead of like respecting boundaries and going like, you know what, this person actually deserves a whole ass life. And so I think I was reaching that point where it's just like, okay, my soul is being stuck. My energy is being drained and I have nothing to show for myself. And luckily I had the support of my man because he was the one that kind of saw me stressed out. And he's just like, listen, if you want to pursue your passions, financially, I got you. Let this go and pursue what you want to pursue. So with that being said, and I always tell people, because I know a lot of women who are in relationships where their partner is sucking resources from them. If you are in one of those, like vacate immediately, whoever you're with, 
you can be that much stronger if you have someone that supports you and not takes from you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is, I mean, that is a word all on its own. And I think right. that, that we <laughs> delve into on its own, but because it's Picking the right partner. Sometimes you think you picked the right one and then you realize you probably didn't. What is the exit ex- right. you know? right. ex- strategy? Not the exit point. strategy. Listen. Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I think that's um that's incredible though to say that you you leaned on someone else because another thing when we're doing these some of these conversations, it's it seems like it's more so, and not to put it because sometimes it is all on you when you're doing that you know, lifting up yourself by your bootstraps, but oftentimes you do need that community. You need that support. And so I think, what was it for you? Because if he detected that in you and said something, but you know, what would it be like for you to ask for that help to say, you know what, I'm not at the stage or my life that I want to be in. And it's because I now have to make a choice or make that pivot. What did that conversation look like? Well, Honestly, I don't remember the exact conversation, but to piggyback off of asking for help, like when I made my film, I did have to humble myself because when I was making the film, I got up to a tab of, you know, I think once I hit like 50 grand, I quit my job. So I didn't have an extra 50 grand in my bank account. Where did I get it from? I had to ask everyone that I've ever met in my life, every Facebook friend that I have for money. So I had to ask everyone I know for help. And it's one of the most humbling experiences. But the thing is, one of the fun things you find out is like the people around you that will help you make your dream come true. And a lot of times, a lot of the people will be people you won't even expect. It will be your homies that you're like, yo, I go get drinks with you like every Friday and you couldn't even put a dollar towards my film. And then, you know, just somebody who's a Facebook friend just respects your hustle and is like, yo, I want to see a black woman rise. So I'm going to give you um, hundreds of dollars. So it's, it's a humbling experience. It taught me the importance of asking for help. And then when you're doing something great, you know, other people actually want to be a part of it. I was creating something for us, for black health. So a lot of people who don't have time to say, make a film, it's good for them to have the opportunity to still contribute something to society. I love that. I mean, I feel like that's really when you start to realize who your friends are and who isn't, right? Like, be like, dang, okay, girl, like, what the heck? You know, but I feel like that's Mm -hmm. kind of um, make your circle smaller. I feel like people always say that when you get older, your circle gets smaller, you start to really see who's really there and who's really not, who respects the hustle and who doesn't. Um, I know that you also work on Unsung. You were an I used to work on Unsung. Yeah, exactly. You used to work on Unsung um, as an associate producer. I want to know, like, first of all, I really like that show. <laughs> first of all, I love <laughs> that show. I really, I love just like the celebrity, like, gets to know everything. This happened in this group. That didn't happen in this. Someone paid me. Someone ripped me off. Like, I'm here for all the drama. Um, <laughs> I'm here for it all. But tell me, like, who did you meet? Who did you learn from in that experience? Because I would assume being an associate producer would help you in your filmmaking process. I learned, I, that's what I learned. I learned the process. So working on a documentary series, I saw how they put the documentary together. And I honestly think whenever you work a job, if there is nothing for you to learn at that job, you need to leave and you need to leave quickly. Like when I was there, my, my whole purpose for being there was simply like, okay, I need, you do this first, then you do this, then you do this, learn how they do everything so you can do it for yourself. Not so you can just be someone else's, you know, slave until you retire. I think that should be the, that should be the game when you go to these companies, like learn their game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Learn that game, girl. Absolutely. Well, then real quick then, in terms of the game, sometimes it's really the biggest part or biggest hurdle for a lot of folks is even getting into the door. So for something like Unsung, how did that opportunity come about or opportunities like it um, came about for you to have that opportunity to learn? So one thing about, you know, entertainment, they always say it's a business. Of, I mean, it's an industry where nepotism is very real and who you know is very important. And almost every job that I've gotten is because I I knew someone at the company. So Unsung was no different. Someone I worked with on a previous show, she was there to vouch for me and then I got the job. So relationships are super important. Relationships are super important. And so when we're talking about that, like how do you feel like someone who's maybe listening or watching, what would be the best way to make connections, genuine connections with people to kind of do, to get your foot in the door, but obviously not 
be like, hey, I need that job. You know, exactly. Yeah. Not make it uh, like, you know, I'm using you for this, but like, I, I do care and I want to help. Like, how do you make those connections to get your foot in the door? One thing I think helps is just being genuine. You know, whatever you're trying, if you go into the world and you treat, you know, whenever you go out partying and you meet people, if you treat it like a business, if you treat it like a transaction, it's going to feel like a transaction. If you just talk to people and kind of just talk to a bunch of people and see who you naturally gel with and kind of make sure those people know what you're trying to do. I think that's a better, I personally think that's a better way to go about it. Yeah, that's got to be the only, especially in this industry too, because it's kind of like, like you said, people it's very looking at you sideways, yeah. <laughs> real fast. Even though yeah, played the same game, but it's like, yeah, no, I don't want to play the game with this person if I know that's you know, your motive. That's your motive, right? right. <laughs> and then, and then the other thing that people don't consider is when they're out networking, like they're only trying to talk to, like, oh, this is the VP of Sony. Let me try to talk to them. Most likely, the VP of Sony, honestly, he probably won't even want to talk to you. Your best bet, be nice to everyone you meet because you might meet a janitor and then you tell them like, oh yeah, this is what I'm doing. Janitor, oh yeah, my cousin works at Sony. Let me give him a call. And you can get, you know, you get in that way. So in LA, it's so many people who have connects. So just, and also putting your work out there. Like a lot of the, you know, gigs I've got through Invisible Vegan, it wasn't because I went out and tried to, you know, sell myself to people. It was because I put myself online and and people saw the product and they liked the product and then they reached out um, for me to like do panels and stuff. So yeah, put your work out there and let your work speak for itself too. Yeah, I think that that's like great advice. Um, I know for sure, like, just being in the room and being nice to people. Um, I was at a work function and it was, we were launching a new show and I was just taught, like someone asked me like, my, like I was an assistant. So if someone was just asking me like, oh, what about blah, blah, blah. And we were at the party and I'm talking to this w- woman. I didn't know who she was at the time. She ends up being a writer on one of the shows that we were having on the network. And she actually was one of our first guests on the podcast. Our very first guest. Our very first guest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Just being nice to people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. absolutely. Having that genuine connection with people is everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But let's get into Invisible Vegan. Yeah. Because I feel like that we've been talking about everything else and it keeps getting brought up. It keeps getting like pushed in there. So I, let's just get into it. So yes. Invisible Vegan. Um, how about you give the quick synopsis yeah. before we ask any questions about it for folks who may not know or would definitely want them to check it out afterwards. Quick synopsis or log line for Invisible Vegan. Okay, so Invisible Vegan is pretty much just dispelling a lot of the myths around Black food culture, that it's monolithic and that we all eat the same. And it's showing that there's a whole plant-based movement um, where people are eating plant-based foods um, for their healing properties. And this is being left out of the narrative. Like we're not being acknowledged as a race of people who eat healthy plant-based food. And just like soul food, this other strand of healthy eating is also a part of our culture. And my film highlights that part of our culture. A question about like that too. Why do you think that that is being left out of the narrative, the healthy, the vegan eating? Why do you think that's being left out of the um, the narrative? And I watched the trailer of the documentary and in the um, voiceover, you were saying how you thought it was just like a white people thing, like organic, this blah, blah. Like, you know, people in wherever are eating this organic way or whatever. Um, what, so I want to know, like, why do you think, I mean, I kind of have my own assumptions, but I was like, I want to hear, like, what do you think, why do you think that is being left out of the narrative? Oh, because um, before, the, I mean, this moment is very different, but before we look at Black history in general, you know, you take food out of it. Um, when they talk about Black history, like Black history always revolved around slave culture. Like, look, this is you as slaves. This is you struggling. This is you know, you failing or in some kind of way and food is no different. So it's just like, oh, look, this is you. You guys eat unhealthy foods and you get high blood pressure. Like that's just, that's just how we're taught about everything. And when you start recognizing the successes of the culture, that's when you start recognizing their brilliance and their genius. And that's something that, you know, the powers that be wanted to suppress for a very long time. They don't want us to know like, hey, a lot of this plant-based stuff that we're pushing now has very deep roots in a lot of indigenous societies. But we don't want to put that out there because we rather 
whitewash it and take credit for it. So I think that's why um, we're not told because other people just want the credit for it. Absolutely. And I know, I mean, we can get into it as well, but cost for sure is a huge barrier when it comes to food access, food, you know, you know, healthy dieting, healthy living. And the fact that in a lot of black and brown communities, there are food deserts. You have about one or two supermarkets you can choose from, potentially these, this chain or that chain, this mom and pop store that doesn't have the access to these type of foods. And then a lot of folks, when they know about it or even think, because sometimes it's right in your backyard too, to be able to go ahead and, and have these healthier food options to become a vegan. But sometimes when you're thinking that is so much of a detriment, you're less likely to even try. And so I, I just wanted to get your insights too for um, around that, around food access, around opportunities for black people to really now that, to in a sense, go back to their roots and be able to explore veganism, veganism in, in a healthy way. So in, in my documentary, that's one of the things I bring up because I talk about plant-based be eat, plant eating and I also kind of critique the mainstream vegan movement. Like when you guys are out here, you're telling everybody like, oh, go vegan you ignore the very real circumstances that you just named that a lot of communities of color are going to are going through. So that's something that I definitely acknowledge. And, and even just the idea of someone from one culture kind of going into a space of other people and telling them how they should be eating, just how inappropriate that action is if you don't really know anything about the culture. You want them to eat your way, but you haven't taken the time to learn anything about the group. Um, it, it's something that's done in this country a lot that I think a lot of people are tired of. So when a lot of people of color dismiss veganism, they're just dismissing like, look, I don't want anyone to tell me how to eat. I don't want anyone to tell me how to do my hair. I just want to exist. I'm tired of having to be a certain way to be acceptable in this country. So kind of breaking, you know, bringing that into the, the narrative as well. Such a great perspective, because honestly, oftentimes when we're talking about it, or when I hear mainstream media, mainstream business folks talking about it, it's more so the economics of it all and the access of it all. But no one, at least that I've heard, talking more so about the, the sociological effects of someone else coming in and telling you what to do when it comes to your food. And I think that's so important. A lot of public health prof professionals can probably take some learnings from that when they're deciding on what to do within each community. So great, great option to share. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that um, in your documentary, you do have some famous faces. Um, so I saw Cedric the Entertainer, mm -hmm. I saw John Sally in there talking about, um, you know, food and their eating. I know that Cedric the Entertainer did lose a lot of weight. I did not know that he was eating. <laughs> so, I mean, that is great. Um, I wonder, within the documentary, I mean, I only saw a little bit of the trailer. So were they, did they explain their story as to like what drove them to want to be vegan? Like we see, you know, I know it's a celebrity, it's a celebrity, right? So you're like celebrities, they have all the access, they have all the money to do whatever, but to really be vegan, I feel like it's a choice. Um, so did they explain their journey at all within the doc? They talked about, um, I didn't include, actually I did that in the, um, we talked about it in the interview, but some of it, I didn't include it in the film because I used my journey as kind of the foundation of the film and then they just accent it. But um, John Sally does talk about his NBA career and how even though he was an athlete, he was extremely unhealthy and he had back problems. And, and then he started eating plant-based and his game got better. A lot of his um, ailments started going away. So they do kind of talk about their experience. Yeah. I love that. Do you think that in modern medicine, now I know this is like a little bit out there, mm -hmm. um, but do you think like the reason why black people, we have high blood pressure, right? The or, you know, diabetes, diabetes attack, heart, stroke, mm -hmm. all, of the, all of the things, we have all <laughs> of the things happening. Um, do you think that veganism is a way to solve some of these issues? You know, it's a bold statement because some, and some people will make it that they think, you know, veganism will cure every disease under the sun. I would say that a holistic lifestyle in general um, as a package, because you can be vegan all day, but if you're breathing dirty air, 
and you're not getting any sleep and you're constantly stressed out with cortisol running through your veins, you'll probably just get cancer like everybody, you know, like, like all these other people who are suffering. So I think the whole, a holistic lifestyle in general, but yes, eating plant-based, there is scientific research that shows that it reduces a lot of those degenerative diseases, whether you're talking about diabetes two, heart disease, less likely to get cancer, not saying that you can't get cancer, but just less likely. So I definitely think it's a, it's a good health move if done correctly. Absolutely. Absolutely. What would you say, um, you know, cause every, every medium you put out every, you know, movie or, or some sort of, again, content that folks put out, there's usually some sort of call to action or one takeaway or something that you want folks to truly understand if they take the time to, to view your documentary, what would that be for Invisible Vegan? So one thing about my film is it's not forceful. One thing I didn't like about the mainstream vegan movement, the way I was exposed to it, and in particular, like the animal rights community, it was just way too aggressive. You know, it's just like, hey, look, don't come at me like that. You know, no, you, you just can't. And so my film is very just not aggressive. It's more like, hey, look understand understand where I come from, but that's all I'm asking you really to do. I'm not saying that you're a monster if you still want to eat meat, but I'm just, this film is just something for you to understand my choices. And I think that's what it was for a lot of even my friends. Like they'll tell me like, you know what? I'm not going to go vegan tomorrow, but I'm going to try meatless Mondays or I'm not going to go vegan, but I definitely understand where you're coming from. And that's, that was my, that's all I really wanted. Yeah, I love that. I know, uh, <laughs> I was like, there's like, so many things I'm gonna ask. <laughs> thing too, I'm like, <laughs> I have to look back just to see what Ebony's facial expression was during this moment. I can think of it. <laughs> I'm not sure. We're always on the same page. So it's like, she wants to talk, I want to talk. Yeah. She wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. So it's always yes, like, yes, just yes. trying to stay in tune with each other. <laughs> oh, you guys are very in tune. Like I'm feeling the vibe. I love it. Great, great, great. I want to know just um, based on when this when this aired and when you were kind of, or even before then, when you were kind of putting the tools together to make this happen to even now post, I wouldn't even say the Black Lives Matter movement was a moment in time, but at least the height of it all um, last year and the change that people are now coming out to seek Black content, to seek, you know, Black owned businesses, to seek what was happening from, you know, Create, being created in a sense from black people in every facet in every industry. Did you see some sort of change or some sort of you know increase in people's wanting to understand your point of view when it came to the invisible vegan, when it came to veganism in general? Um, just curious as to if there was any effect of that or even any effect personally for you to, to, to want to continue on the path that you're on. What I saw was once George, once George Floyd happened, you have a bunch of vegan organizations that now want you to speak at their events mm -hmm. you know so that that's what you saw I don't know and the thing is I don't know if that's change or if that's like hey you just trying to get a black person real quick to save face so I definitely think you know this moment it created a lot of awareness not just in the vegan movement just all across the board and it created genuine awareness for a lot of people but for others I think it kind of created you know, hey, let me just add a black person in here so no one thinks I'm racist. But I really didn't take in what happened to the that should have. I, I didn't really digest it. I just want to look like I digested it. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I feel like when everything was happening in 2020, um, I feel like a lot of companies, I feel like that was this consensus amongst the community um, or also for myself um, um, that a lot of companies were kind of like, oh, we'll give you Juneteenth off. Oh, you want, you know, this is how, well, okay. Like whatever black people want today, we will grant your wish today. You know, it felt very like, is this genuine? Like now you have a whole list of like black history month and things to watch on whatever streaming service. It was like, I was, I was a part of that. That was part of that too happening too. But I think what, what really made it um, interesting too, outside of that was the idea that, wait, so this whole time you heard us because if, if you were able to have these changes, honestly, in the drop of a hat, some of these things were able to happen in the course of two weeks. We saw the Washington Redskins, for instance, become, I think, the Washington Football League. So it's outside of the Black community, too, within different minority groups. And the fact that it was being able to be changed almost overnight 
you kind of thought, well, what, what was, what was going on all this other time? Cause we were saying the same message right. and you obviously, it obviously got to your doorstep and yet it took the situation to say, okay, well, this, this, <laughs> this thing that was on my desk, let me go ahead and dust it off and <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> so, so, so it's interesting. And that's why I wanted to ask, cause I'm sure it touched everyone. And I'm sure, especially with you having such a niche content space and really being an advocate for veganism um, as a whole. I don't wanna say black veganism because as you mentioned, veganism is across the board within our community too. Um, I'm, I was certain that something may have happened. Someone may have tapped you <laughs> for something, so. Mm -hmm. I love the question that you had earlier. Mm -hmm. um, the question was kind of, Jasmine, how do you feel about being considered, I guess, like an other in a space that we occupied first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. You know, now, because when I, even when I created the film, I was younger, I was in my twenties. Now, you know, moving into like well into my thirties, it doesn't bother me as much as it used to, you know, like now I kind of look, and I think it's because I've been around a lot of my um, other black friends. And to be honest, a lot of them are in need of just as much healing and just as much change as a lot of, um, you know, the, the white people that we're complaining about, you know, in this country, it just, it's created such a, we're built on such a bad, ignorant foundation, kind of, you know, it's affected everyone. So you have a lot of, a lot of my black friends are kind of moving in anger. And I'm like, wait, that's not, that's not the way to move either. We can't reside in anger. We can't reside in bitterness. Like we have to be about healing as well. And we have to be open to, you know, teaching people and we can't shut down. Oh, they need to learn. Stuff. It's like, no, that's not the energy um we all need to move in love and if they ask to you know if they ask to be educated help them so now that space it doesn't it doesn't bother me as much because I, I don't feel united with any race at this point like I don't want to unite with black people because of what we are I want to unite with black people whose values I genuinely connect with so like now I'm just like I'm just a human being in a room <laughs> at this point or that's what I'm, I'm working toward right I feel like we all want to work towards that energy because that it would feel so nice to not have to put your guard up every time you're in a room with someone or um, a conversation change because someone else enters the room right but to be genuinely seen as a human being felt that way and express yourself in that manner I feel like it's definitely a goal that I feel like everyone wants to eventually reach. Absolutely. Hopefully we can do yeah. it sometime. Yeah. I don't know when. Yeah. But Hopefully. Sometimes it's a simple choice to say, you know what, today's the day and we'll, we'll let the chips <laughs> fall, <laughs> fall as they may. Um, so I'm curious too, as you mentioned, the documentary in your 20s, some time ago you came out with this concept and I think it's very much timeless. It's definitely something that folks can learn at any point, any stage. Um, of their life, but is there anything now if you, when you look back on it to say, oh, you know what, I wish I said this, or perhaps I have enough content now for a part two, like what would be some additional things that you want people to know about this lifestyle and about your journey? I would have, so when I first, when I was first putting the doc together, there wasn't all of these vegan junk food options that there are now, you know, there wasn't, you know, the vegan Whopper, there wasn't, you know, vegan Ben and Jerry's, it wasn't all this junk food. So in my film, I'm kind of advocating like, oh, veganism is a, a, a healthier way. But if you're eating a bunch of like fake vegan meat and French fries and potato chips and pasta every day, it's like, no, you're worse off than the person eating chicken Caesar salads, honestly. So I didn't, um, I didn't make that distinction in my film and I wish I did. <laughs> That Good makes point. sense That's because there are, it was really funny. I was like, I knew someone that was vegan and I was like, I don't understand how you're vegan. Like you're healthy, blah, blah, blah. But there are, you could eat the cupcakes and the <laughs> chips and the cookies and the this, this. So I was like, okay, the body don't match up to what I thought the vegan was going to equal to. Like that was how I was feeling about Not it. the but body don't match up. <laughs> up. <laughs> it didn't. And I was really confused, but that makes sense because there are things like, nutter butters I didn't think oreos like i think they're vegan and so but they're not healthy <laughs> but oreos are vegan oreos yeah. are definitely vegan <laughs> yeah, so they're not healthy and so i think that that is a really good distinction to make like you can be vegan but it's about being plant-based um is where i think 
you know, you can make that distinction. It's, you know, be healthy. And then within the documentary, you always, you also talk about, which I think we kind of touched on, but just to even like drive it home a little bit more, like when we are in our communities, when we are at home, um, and you said that like you weren't all the way vegan, you kind of transitioned into veganism. What kind of food did you guys grow, did you grow up on? Like, what did you eat at home? <laughs> Uh, everything. Um, you know, my mom, she, you could tell like there was an emphasis on health and, and you saw like a transition too. So, you know, at first we eat fried chicken and after a while I noticed like, oh, we're not really frying chicken anymore. We're baking it all. So she was like getting healthier and healthier, but yeah, I grew up, um, I think normally for dinner, I'd have a meat and maybe two side dishes, a vegetable and a starch for lunch. You know, she packed me with, uh, maybe like two fruits, and you know a snack and some a sandwich of some sort but yeah just kind of your standard american diet but not not too it wasn't too savage right right that's good and how did how did folks react i know you said when you went um away to college when you started to explore veganism or just other eating options how did your family your friends react when you said you know what today's the day that I'm going to become vegan. Cause I can only imagine Thanksgiving when you're the one. <laughs> the only <laughs> one. I got to make all the special dishes for you. Because you don't want to eat nothing I got to make. Like, you know? Or just starve. Crazy. That's the nice part. It's like, you know what? Right. You don't even get to eat today. You're done. I'm curious. How, how is that? Cause that's another barrier for folks. People, food is a sense of community too. And so people don't want to feel left out by being the only one um, deciding right. to <laughs> eventually better their, their life. <laughs> Yeah, no, it definitely, I think most of my friends and family, they kind of just laughed. You know, I became like the joke, like, oh, like you're just a vegan diet. You know, it's kind of a joking thing. And then, um, oh, I lost my thought. Um, Speaking of the jokes, you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, and then I moved to, since I moved to California, people thought that was a thing. You know, my friends from DC are like, oh, so you moved to Hollywood now. So you can't eat what you grew up eating now. Like it became that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so on Thanksgiving, like what do you eat? <laughs> so, I'm, <laughs> so I'm actually now, I'm not, I'm not really on Thanksgiving like that. Because the thing about Thanksgiving is, you know, people use Thanksgiving like, oh, it's the one day you can kind of eat treacherously. And I'm like, but most people just eat reckless every day of the week. So like, why do you need a holiday to kind of do, just go even more overboard? So I'm kind of like over that tradition. And even just what the holiday stands for, it's kind of like, huh, why am I, why am I even indulging in this? So yeah, it's not like a big holiday on my list. Um, if I do make something, like if people are coming through, I think one year, I feel like I had buffalo cauliflower, some like sweet potato casserole situation. And you can still do all the sides. You can do, you know, vegan mac and cheese, vegan collard greens. You can still do all that stuff. You and just don't, okay you don't this? do turkey. <laughs> people huh? people were fine with this when they came over, they were like, oh, what is, what are we eating today? Like, they were okay with <laughs> So, yeah, normally my friends, if they come to my house for Thanksgiving, they already know what's up. Or they can, or I allow people to bring, you know, if you want to bring something for yourself, you know, if you want to bring a turkey, like you can bring your food. I'm not, I'm not that person because I don't want people to come to in my home and thinking like, oh, she's forcing her vegan lifestyle on us. It's like, no, this is what I'm eating. This is what I'm preparing. But feel free to do your thing. I feel like that's fair. Yeah. Okay. Because I have a friend and he is like straight up vegan and I'm like, we can what restaurants are we going out to like what what are we doing like where are we going what am I I can't even eat off your plate like it's just it's just yeah I'm trying to get used to it I'm trying to just like take a deep breath because it is a different they just got to be the planner they have to be the one to say okay we're doing yeah. this we're that's what it is compromise right they gotta compromise. do that yeah they gotta do that <laughs> right. or or like for me, so I'm a French fry lover. So whenever people go to restaurants, I'm not like a friend that's difficult. It's just like, well, wherever y'all go, it's going to be some French fries or some kind of like side vegetable on the menu that I'll eat. Because I go out for, you know, I go out just to be with friends. It's not always, you know, food is not, I don't really want food to be a hobby. You know, I want it to be like, yeah, this is something I do every now and then for fun. But for the most part, like this is what I do to survive. So I'm going to do it intentionally. I feel okay. like that is that's the vegan, that's oh the vegan mindset right that there. Is a, that is. All, you have to have it. 
it is it is no shade like it is it's such a good mindset to have I'm trying to get back I really actually need to be like eating healthy Jasmine I'm gonna call you after this girl okay because I need to get back on my uh my diet plans and the working out but um I like this overall theme though too with a lot of what you're saying and it sounds like you make your own decisions. You figure it out, like even down to Thanksgiving, deciding, is this something that I even want to do, do want to <laughs> celebrate? And I think that's a major theme that has happened in a lot of courses of your life too, is just the idea of, you know what, let me challenge the status quo in a sense and decide for myself what works. Like, is yeah. that, am I fair in that assumption? Is that kind of how you- Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And even, and even things like, you know, my homegirl came over on- Saturday. So it's like, me and my mom, we went, we got like a big feast just so we can all watch Coming to America together. So like, you know, it doesn't have to be Thanksgiving. I don't, yeah, don't even need to entertain that. But, but I still, but I still celebrate though. I still celebrate moments. I still love that you're with food. You're really close to like your roots too. Like even you mentioned like even what the holiday of Thanksgiving represents, right? Like what that even means. Um, and that you're conscious about that. And I feel like you're also conscious about the fact that like, again, being vegan is something that was like our ancestors did. You know, that was something that was a theme in, you know, slavery times and whatever you ate. Like we're not in slavery times. I heard in the documentary or in the um, trailer, it was like, we're, we no longer are, a slave. We can pick what it is that we want to eat. We don't have to, you know, be subject to making what to do. Um, they said something about you would eat the scraps, like, you know, Black families, or they would have to eat the scraps of whatever was left over. And it's like we're no longer in those, like, desperate times, and we do have um, license over our lives to pick what it is that we choose to eat. And I think that that was an amazing point. Yeah. And even not to, like, um, knock down soul food but there's a way to do soul food in a healthy way and i think people kind of miss the point of what happened during slavery like the point of slavery wasn't hey we should hold on to the chitlins the point was we should hold on to the ingenuity that it took for us to create a delicacy in such a hard time so if we can do that then a lot of these dishes that we love we can make healthier versions of them we can make versions of them that won't put onto your grandma in the hospital with diabetes and then, you know, celebrate at her funeral with the same foods that put her in her grave. Like, I think we we're reaching a point in time where we can be a little bit more conscious. I, yes, absolutely. And I know I want you to name some, if you, if you do just either favorite foods, favorite restaurants, or just, you know, for folks who after listening to this are at least it's inspired to do what we call the meatless Mondays or to go (laughs) full on vegan and just don't know where to start. You know, obviously after watching your documentary, that should be number one. And then the second piece, what should folks do who want to really tap into this, this um, really tap into their ancestry in a sense? So one thing I would say, especially for if you're a new vegan, just to make it simple, like don't, don't make it overly complicated. So as far as foods, think about, think of it like this. Half the food that you already eat is probably vegan. So it's just a matter of, you know, if you go to Chipotle, you still go to Chipotle, just knock the steak and the cheese off the burrito, like this guac, rice, beans, the tomatoes, like you still, it's still good without all the, the extra. Or if you go to, you know, you're into Asian food, you want your noodles, just don't get the combination noodles, get the vegetable chow mein. Like it's, it's just as good. Or when you go to a restaurant, a lot of times they'll have a, a lot of different side items. Like I'll take a, side, a bunch of side items. Oh, let me get the hummus, the spinach, the French fries, this, and have me a whole little platter and then I have a meal. So I think that's a, um, that would be a good place to start. And my favorite foods, it depends on the week. Like I get in these tangents where like one week or maybe a month or two, I'll just want acai bowls every day. And then the next month it's just like, oh, I want some oatmeal every day. But my palate is pretty simple at this point. And I love like cabbage. So like for dinner, sometimes I'll just have a whole plate full of cabbage and put some hot sauce on it. And that's not well balanced. Like of course, you know, you need more like protein and stuff in there, but I just love cabbage. 
I love that. And a lot of the foods that you're naming, I'm like, wow, you know what? It's easier than you think. You hear vegan, and you're like, okay, like scary, you know, good for you, but this is, <laughs> but yeah. whatever, but it's easier. Yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of things you can do. Yeah. And then some, some of the food, like you can make, you can even make it quicker when you take the meat off of it. So if you're making spaghetti, if you like the taste of say mushrooms, sauteing some mushrooms only takes a few minutes. I mean, not that, you know, take making ground beef over the stove takes a long time, but the mushrooms will probably be quicker than, you know, the meat. You can just use that as your base and it's still good as long as you know how to season. That's the yes. key. Right. <laughs> um, would you even recommend, like, I know they do have a lot of like meatless things like Beyond Meat and there's like All Star and like some other like meat meatless options. Like, would you suggest those things or those kind of, I know maybe they have soy in them, which I don't think is that great. It depends because they have lots of different um, options. Like some are, some use soy, some use pea, uh, the pea protein. So I would just say maybe try, like think of those items as your junk food. Like you don't want to eat, you know, fake vegan meat and all that stuff every day. But you know, you kind of miss the, the texture of meat, the taste. I think it's a really good bridge food. Like it's a really good, like, oh, I want to, you know, live on the wild side today. <laughs> <laughs> the wild side of some meatless meat okay i love it love it, love it. Gone wild. <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm hearing that should be the title of part two I right I love, it. <laughs> I love it and speaking of the title you said Inv invisible vegan is the title of your documentary i know at the end you said something i don't want to be an invisible vegan so i just want to know can you explain what that exactly that title means so I picked that title, it's a book uh, by Ralph Ellison, the novel, The Invisible Man. And in the intro of the book, he talks about how he feels invisible in white spaces, but then when he goes into black spaces, he feels equally invisible because he doesn't fit into certain stereotypes. And it's just like, oh, that is definitely how I feel as a vegan. So when, um, so I use that as a title. And when I said in my film, I don't want to be an invisible vegan. I said that because when I was growing up, I didn't see a lot of, um, I didn't see a lot of black female examples of people who were compassionate about the environment, that were compassionate about animals. That's just not an example that we had. And like now that I'm exposed to black, especially black women who are like, no, you know, we need, we should be living in harmony with the earth and we should be doing everything we can to repair her and live in harmony with her instead of destroying her like we're doing now. I think that's a really beautiful um, thing that needs to be more visible, especially to our people. Because at the end of the day, like black lives don't matter if we ruin the planet. So, you know, it should it should definitely be a thing. Yeah. What Absolutely. are some other sustainable ways that you choose to live? Is it like cycling? Are you in, you said holistic. So like, what exactly does that encompass? Oh, it, it, encom it encompasses so much that, you know, I feel like honestly, I couldn't live an entirely holistic life if I tried. There's certain things I do, like for the most part, um, I don't buy too many new clothes. A lot of my clothes are recycled because, you know, a lot of that stuff piles up. We're just creating waste and for what? Like you can get really nice name brand clothes at that on a lot of these sites. So I buy from, um, and I buy from companies with values that I support. Um, even little things like trying to get away from plastic, um, not trying to be, you know, like trying not to be wasteful. Um, paying attention to where my clothes come from. Because again, you know, as women of color, as black people, we definitely complain about white people who are complicit, but yet it's just like, what Malaysian baby made your shirt though? And did, were you complicit in it? Or did you take the time to really think about like where you're buying your stuff? Cause if you're not, you're supporting slavery, just like the people that you're yelling at. So kind of just being more conscious of all those things. And even in my, on my balcony, I have a whole little garden out there where I'm like growing tomatoes and beets and just trying to learn how to um, grow my own food so I can, you know, be sustainable in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I feel that. like it takes, you know, mm -hmm. definitely a lot of discipline and just really paying attention to things. I feel like 
we do things so quickly without even thinking it's like the instant gratification the excitement of like oh I the new cl- I mean I'm definitely guilty <laughs> I shop a lot um you know the new clothes the new shoes the new this the new that and we're definitely not thinking about who's making it where is it come from like is it made in the U.S. if it's not you know like we're or not- what does that really mean taking that extra step I think yeah. and I think what you're saying mm-hmm. is important too because like you said, holistic lifestyle, there's so much into it, but you're picking and choosing which ones make the best sense for you. And yeah. so, and that's the most, that's the biggest way to not make something seem as daunting to say it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Deciding that this is what works best for you to live a better life and to be more conscious of the space that you're taking up in this, on this earth. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's definitely key. Yeah, just being conscious of your energy and the people who do it, you know, and I, cause I don't want to sound like I'm past it, you know, like you, you buy a lot of clothes. I'm not passing judgment because I used to love clothes, used to be the same way. Um, but the examples aren't even there, you know, so if you're kind of around, everybody's doing the same thing. You, you do, you just get caught up in the culture. Like that doesn't say anything about you. Then, you know, you're just busy working and living your life. But if there were more examples of that kind of thinking put in the forefront, um, I think we all would make a lot of different choices, especially if we had the blueprint for something like that. Yeah. Do you think that like, I don't know where you live in California, but um, do you think that maybe the fact that you take a step back, like since you're not in this like nine to five working crazy entertainment industry, like, you know, you're doing your filmmaking. Do you think that that also helped you kind of take a look at yourself and say, hey, I need to be more conscious about X. Oh, absolutely. Because now, now I'm working, I'm actually working on a documentary series. So when it's just like, wow, when you start working and putting all your energy into something, you don't have time to say, okay, what's the story on my dinner? You just need it on the table. Um, So yeah, when you get to take that time out, you definitely become more aware of your choices. Absolutely. I love that. You kind of, you started it, but I'm I'm curious, just what's, what's next for you? Like you're working on a documentary now, you have a lot of things going on with, um, and potentially even are you building a community through your documentary and people reaching out? I'm curious, that's a two part question. For one, <laughs> how's the community looking like the reactions from not only your friends, but from folks who watch in the general space and how are you starting to sustain that in a way, sustain that momentum? And then secondly, what's next for you now that you kind of got that first major, major project out there? So as far as, um let's see the community that I've created. Yeah, like something, um, I had a tragedy last month and a lot of my new friends showed up in a way for me while I was grieving that even my old friends didn't. And I was just like, wow, I was really impressed at kind of like the new energy that I've attracted through my life. So when you start, I guess, because I started caring about more things, I started attracting people who are a little bit more just um, just aware on all levels, like even just being aware of your energy and like the amount of happiness or if you're draining people, like people who are more aware of stuff like that. So I am pretty happy with the new community that I seem to be attracting as a result of meeting people through this particular film. And what's next is I am tackling a document, I'm tackling eating disorders because with food, I do like working in the food space. And I think people are very much aware of like the, you know, the skinny white girl who's anorexic and needs to go to a facility, but they're not aware of the woman that say looks just like me or there's a size 18 or 20 and she has an unhealthy relationship with food and she's binge eating in order to deal with her trauma. Like that's also how an eating disorder can manifest. So just um, breaking the stereotypes of what eating disorders look like and showing, you know, all people who suffer from them and people who, you know, maybe when in their community, mental health resources aren't available or they don't have the insurance to cover these residential treatment facilities that you see these affluent girls going to on most of the um, mainstream uh, movies about the topic. Yes, I am obsessed I'm with excited. the fact, obsessed and excited with the fact that you're deciding to stick with the food space because I think you have a unique point of view. And again, just the idea of, and just a backdrop on me, I studied public health in undergrad. And so with all of this that you're saying, I'm like, yes, 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 <laughs> I'm here for it. But I think also is the idea that 
you know, again, breaking the status quo, the fact that yes, you've seen it visually one way, what does that then do to a lot of the professionals who work in this field and how they in turn treat certain people who may have the same symptoms, but because you're not used to seeing it in this face, right. in this shape, in this size, um, in this color, you're less <laughs> right. likely to be like, okay, let me offer the same assistance. And so I like that you're putting out that out there. And that's the whole purpose of media to put this kind of, these kind of stories out there. And I'm, yeah, I'm stories that mean something. That mean I'm, something. I'm so excited yeah. to hear and watch that film. I feel like it will have a good message. Um, yeah, yeah. People need to hear these things. Yes. People need to yes. know people. It needs to be said. Um, yeah. Cause people, a lot of people think that, um, a lot of these superficial standards of beauty is what health is. And it's just like, no, the girl who's a size, she might be a beautiful size four, but she might be throwing up to look that way. Whereas you might have the girl who's a size 16, she might be walking for 45 minutes a day and eating the healthiest foods on the planet. It's just her body is shaped differently. So we have to kind of break these stigmas, you know, we're just looking at the wrong things. I'm curious to know, like in the documentary, are you, like also circling back around to like, is there going to be an update at the end or like of these women that are, that you're featuring or, you know, are you helping them through the food space with vegan options or is there any part of that connection happening? No, because I'm not really following, I'm not following their journey per se, but one of the points that I want to hit home, which, you know, one of the ladies is hitting home is it's still a struggle. So when a lot of times we talk about problems, you always get like the person who, oh, I had this problem, now I'm better. Instead of like, no, the reality of most serious problems is that you have it and then you still struggle with it. And it's a day by day thing. And people need to know that if you are in that category, like, hey, I still have to every now and then, I still relapse. You need to know that that space is okay too. Yeah, That's a good point. Absolutely. How did you decide, um, you know, yes, the one thing was deciding to stay in this space and that's the reason why this next chapter for you makes sense. But I'm curious, I don't know if there were um, just general things that you've seen that you saw to say out of everything that you could have tackled when it comes to food and health in the black community to decide now that, you know, eating disorders was that appropriate next step. Oh, because you know what? Cause we're uh, doing this project it also showed me how obsessive people can be about food. You know, like even when you tell people to go vegan, a lot, you'll see some people take it to an unhealthy place where it's like, oh, okay, you know, now I'm vegan. I cut meat out. I want to go sugar-free. Now I want to try keto on top of me. Like it, it just goes to an obsessive place. So I want to make sure that because I'm like advocating for a certain diet, that I'm also being responsible in the advocacy, you know, because I, I don't, you know, I want people to look to, you know, look at me for um, like healthy relationships with food as well and not just the food itself because both are important. Yeah. Right point to hit home. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I love me to, I love to eat. So I get it. And I, 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 you know, there is a balance with like healthy eating, unhealthy eating that I, I get it. Like that totally makes sense. And I don't feel like that relationship part is talked about. It's like kind of highlighted in some of these reality shows, but I don't know if it's highlighted in a healthy way to where people really get yeah. it. Yeah. And especially and even like for us, when we're, you know, when when you're younger and people encourage you to eat, but sometimes a little bit too much, you know, like if you're that kid and you eat, you know, 10 hamburgers at a cookout, it's like, oh, you sure can't eat, love that. Instead of, you know, maybe that's not the best, <laughs> you know, kind of just, making sure that we're promoting healthy relationships with food and not overindulgence or, you know, when someone's eating um, their emotions, you know, making sure, you know, kind of checking in and, and making sure that we're learning how to properly balance food when we're going through emotional issues. So those things are important. Absolutely. How you handle stress. Um, there was a quote that you said um, in authority magazine and I loved it. And I thought it was very, profound. I wanted to know like when you did this interview. So the quote basically says, I wish someone would have told me that happiness comes first. Um, TV jobs can be grueling. I kept working one after the other because I thought they would get me to where I wanted to be before directing my own film and TV show. My goal is to be happy. Um, and so I want to know, you said that you align with your, your, you said your job does not align with your happiness. 
Um, yeah. I think that that is so profound in a way um, because when people do work, whether it's to what they love or if it's not, it's the nine to five, the goal is always money. It's always, I need to do this I, I, to get this. I need, you go to school, you get a job, you do, and it's this idea in society of like, you do X, Y, and Z, and then that's how you equal success. But that's not how you define it. And I love that. I would love for you to like talk about it. No, so, and this also comes from me, you know, I grew up in DC. So DC is more of a professional vibe, whereas LA is very artsy. So, you know, I get, I get to see both. And what you notice is like even people who have fancy titles, like, this is a doctor, this is a lawyer, this is this, a lot of people in those positions, it's not like you're around them and you go, wow, they're just radiating happiness. A lot of times, like they'll be the ones that are still like wanting something else. Like you have that friend that makes a hundred thousand. Oh, if I only could make two hundred thousand, like it's not, you know, it's like work doesn't make them happy and so I think if you just cut out um if you just cut out that chase or that belief that happiness is in some car or it's in some house or it's in some job like I'll have way you know I'm happier watching the sunset at the beach than I am with you know fitting into any designer dress at the end of the day like it it feels good going on like oh I look cute but it's a fleeting moment opposed to like me just having a one-on-one -on -one with nature. It's a totally different experience. So I think um, now I'm just more conscious of that. There we go. And also just being, and just being real with myself. Like most people, I think most people aren't really that happy with their jobs. Um, that's the vibe I get, you know, when I talk to a lot of people cause they just complain about it all the time. So. Choose happiness. It's one life to live. That's yeah, choose, choose that's happiness. That's it. I want to make sure that we leave some time too. I mean, this was an amazing discussion, but I want to make sure we leave some time too for you. If there's anything that we probably didn't ask or didn't say, or or your any other connect product, the dots didn't on. connect the dots on. I feel like we talked about so much, but again, open floor. Anything that you want to share with anyone else um, related to veganism, your projects, anything in between. Uh, I would just say whatever you do, the I guess the thing I'll leave you with, whatever you do, whether it's your diet um, or trying to get other people to follow a diet or whatever, or, or creating your own film or going, creating your own business, whatever you do, do it in love. Don't, and also don't do it in competition with anyone. Make sure that like you are trying to help everyone around you rise and like that should be the spirit behind everything that you do. Because if it's not, then you're just one more asshole making the world that much more annoying. And and, and don't be that person. So just move in love. Yes, move yes. in love. We absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's a great message to um, leave off on. And so Jasmine, please let people know like where can they find you on social? Where can we find the Invisible Vegan or any up other upcoming projects or past projects that you've done? Um, yeah, let us know. Cool. Yeah, I'm around. I'm on social. I'm on uh, Instagram. I'm on TikTok, but I'm not like on TikTok, but I'm on TikTok. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Patreon. And then I have the website, the invisiblevegan.com. And you can check out the film on Amazon Prime, it's on YouTube, it's on Quelly TV, which is the first Black female-owned streaming service, and it's on Tubi TV for people who maybe need a free app, so there's no excuses. And then your social, Did, I know you said you're on a bunch of platforms, what is the handle? I don't think that's What's the handle? Um, at the Invisible Vegan, and then my other one is at Jasmine underscore C underscore Leva. Yeah. <laughs> Love it, love it. <laughs> we love it, Akila girl. Where can I find you on social? Yes, you can find me chatting business, pop culture, lifestyle at Akila Friends, mainly on Instagram. Like you, I may dabble in TikTok every now and then. <laughs> but Evan A, where can they find you? Right, TikTok's just for the scrolling. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can find me on Instagram at Evan A Chapman Twelve, where I'll be highlighting Black-owned businesses. So yeah, I'm super simple, just Insta. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to thank you guys so much. For for watching and hanging in there with us we loved it learning everything about veganism i feel like it's a new wave it's something that you know it's not just 
for now. It's for a lifetime. We want to live long lives. Um, and so, yeah, we thank you so much, Jasmine, for joining us and continuing to listen. So, again, remember to always abide by your ABCs. Always, always be, be creating. creating. See you yeah. next time.